So I'm uh, going to go ahead and get started. Uh, really quick note uh, about myself. Uh, my name is Brad Schiller. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Prompt. We're the largest college admissions essay coaching uh, company in the world. Um, we support about 10 times as many students on 10 times as many essays as, as anybody else. Uh, and so we'll talk a lot about kind of how we think about things and how admissions officers really think about this, uh, and then how you should be thinking about this as you're working with your, your students. Okay. All right. So number one, this is the very, very, very important is what do admissions officers actually care about? Okay. So oftentimes, you know, when we're thinking about like writing our applications, so all the essays, the activities list, additional information section, all of that, those different components, what we often don't think about is what do the admissions officers actually care about? What are they actually looking for? Um, and this is partially because your student has never really had to think much about their audience based off of the writing that they've done in class. So the writing that they've done in class are like, oh, I'm kind of writing this assignment. It's for my teacher. That's about it. Right. They're not really thinking about their audience. Who is actually going to be reading this? What is the purpose of their reading for this? What are they actually reading for within the documents and the essays? OK, and the short end of the story is, is that admissions officers are looking for a signal, a signal that your student will succeed in college and after they graduate. OK, so why is that? It's because admissions officers are really looking for uh, students that are going to actually get on campus and they're going to do well in their classes and they're going to graduate. Okay. If they graduate, guess what? That means they pay tuition every, for at least four years, right? Um, hopefully just four years, <laughs> number one. Uh, number two, right, uh, is that this student is a positive contributor to that school's community, right? So they're making the school better for all the other students around them by as a result of their being there. And another component of this is they want to know that their school in particular can have a positive impact on whatever your student wants to achieve in the future, okay? So these are all the things that they're thinking about. And if it just so happens that you're successful later in life and you make a bunch of money uh, or you do some good deeds that reflect back on well in the school, well, that leads to uh, alumni donation dollars. So these are all things that actually the admissions officers are thinking about uh, when they are selecting students and how they're selecting students is they're really looking at potential. Okay. And they're evaluating that potential based off of past results. So your experiences, your academics, all of that sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, it's not, it's not like, hey, let's, uh, you know, just kind of look for candidates that have really good stories to tell or other things like that. They're really looking for these proof points, these proof, this proof that you're going to succeed in college and beyond. Okay. Now, so how do they actually do this? How do they actually evaluate students? This is the simple way to look at it, okay? Which is basically there's two scores that your student is getting. One is called the academic score and the other is called the personal score. Or sometimes you can just refer to it as like everything that's not academics, all right? Uh, you can pretty much put this on a chart and you have an academic score, you have a personal score, the higher those two scores are, the higher your admissions chances are. Pretty simple, all right? There's two other core concepts to understand here. One is the academic bar and the other is the personal bar. If you are below the academic bar for that institution, it is extremely rare that you will get in, okay? Because when you're below the academic bar, that basically is a signal that students that have academic profiles like you are unlikely to succeed at that college, okay? Once you're above the academic bar, which a lot of students are, um, you are likely to succeed academically and that's just like one hurdle to clear, okay? The same goes for the personal bar. Uh, but it's really hard to evaluate personal aspects a lot of times in the application. So to be above the personal bar uh, is like 98, 99% of students generally. Uh, it's basically like, hey, your essay kind of signals that maybe you have some character flaws. Okay, maybe that's bad. We're going to put you below the, the personal bar. So this is really important concept. And we're going to take a look at how does this break down actually in the Harvard admissions process. And the only reason why we use Harvard is because they were forced to release all of their admissions data and information as part of a, a recent uh, court case that's now going to the Supreme Court, okay? Uh, and I have personally read through every single court case document and compiled and <laughs> synthesized all of that information together. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna talk about tonight, okay? 
So let's talk about the academic score. And this is a really, really, really important concept, which is students self-select where they are applying based off of their academic profile. Okay, so that's based off of your GPA, so all of your grades, what the strength of your curriculum, so what classes have you taken, it might be your AP scores, it might be your standardized test scores, you are self selecting, uh, your student is self selecting where they are applying based off of that. When you're building a school list, you're probably going to these college search tools, and you're implement your you're inputting GPA, you're inputting uh, test scores to get recommendations of schools that may be fits. Okay. Uh, and so what ends up happening is, is because students self-select where they're applying at Harvard, for example, uh, roughly four and five applicants to Harvard, which now is 50,000 applicants a year, uh, are considered to be above their academic bar. Okay. Uh, and roughly speaking, half of those that are above the academic bar are um, very are strongly above the academic bar and half are kind of just sufficient okay but harvard believes all of these students are academically capable of succeeding at harvard so they are willing to take students in the sufficient category or the strong category or a very rare exceptional category uh you know for admissions all right uh and this is a really really important concept because it's really hard to differentiate yourself with academics and that goes across most institutions that that you're applying for okay and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later in terms of okay when is just having a very strong academic profile enough versus when do you also need to really focus on essays and the non-academics components all right so as you can see here basically having a strong academic score is you know increases your admissions chances about 3x compared to a sufficient uh academic score and keep in mind this is 50,000 students at harvard for 2,000 acceptances Okay. And if you're like, hey, my kid has straight A's, you know, and a 1600 on the SAT, guess what? When Harvard evaluates academics, 8,000 students a year get a perfect score on their academic index, an 80 out of 80, 8,000 students a year, okay, for 2,000 positions. Okay. Uh, the average student that gets accepted to Harvard has taken nearly six AP exams and has an average score of a 4.7, okay? Um, so just to give you a sense of when you're in that strong academic category, like it means really strong, okay? Uh, but you're probably in a good case, in many cases in the sufficient academic category at many of these institutions. So, now uh, here Brad, is the thing, yeah. Sorry, interrupting. Um, there is a good question. I just want clarity about um, when you say the academic bar, uh, is that the equivalent of the middle 50% of scores or like the average or above the average? It's not the average, right? Because an academic bar is basically, they look at massive amounts of data um, and they basically determine based off of this student's profile. So GPA, what courses, academic rigor for their curriculum, uh, SAT, ACT scores, they take all of that information and they look at historically how have students actually performed at Harvard, okay? And they know that if you're below a certain academic level, you're just probably not going to cut it, all right? Uh, and so this isn't like middle 50%. This is like, imagine the 60,000 top students in the entire country across all high schools, okay? Um, 17% of those are not at the academic bar. So you're, you're talking about like the one top 1% 1 anyways, uh, that are, you know, even applying, you know, in, in these situations. Okay. So this is, it's, it's a very difficult, uh, thing, but this doesn't just apply to Harvard. This applies to all schools, right? It just happens to be their academic bars may be different. The, what a strong candidate may be is different at one school than, than another school, but this is kind of broadly how they work. And so you may have seen an announcement recently that MIT, for example, which is where I went to school, uh, is requiring the SAT or the ACT again. And the reason that they're doing that is because of this academic bar. They know that students that score below a certain amount on the math section of the ACT or SAT, if they score below a certain amount, they're much less likely to succeed at MIT, okay? And they actually have the data associated with that. And that's why they reinstituted that policy. Um, I don't know what that bar is, but basically it's like a 700 or a 720 out of 800, probably. Uh, if you meet that, you're like, okay, in, you know, Harvard, you know, MIT might believe you're 
have the, the analytical capabilities to succeed at MIT uh, based off of that. So this is why they have or utilize this information uh, is they, and they, they look back at you know, all of this history uh, and it makes sense for them to do so, right? Because they, they want students that are gonna succeed at their school and after they graduate, that's, their, that's what they're trying to do here, okay? So let's talk about the personal score or really everything that's non-academic related, all right? Um, as you can see here, the number of students with possible character flaws are very low, right? So like 0.4% of students are below the personal bar. Um, but really importantly here is that it's almost impossible to be exceptional. That's less than 10 applicants a year get categorized as exceptional, okay? So your goal really, or your student's goal, uh, which is kind of your goal too, right? Uh, with any application is to somehow get to the strong category of the personal score, okay? Uh, because that 10X is your admissions chances. And guess what? This is really like your, uh, how what, not just the activities that you've done, but how you write about them, right? Not just like your experiences, but how do you write about them in your essays? How do you include that in your additional information section? Uh, it could be part of the interview. It could be your recommendations. All of that wraps up into uh, a single score. At Harvard, they actually break out activities and personal score separately, uh, but the personal score matters a lot more. This is the thing that differentiates students, right? This is the thing that gets you in, all right? Uh, and this goes for all highly selective schools, uh, and it also goes, as we'll see soon, for a lot of the you know most selective schools, which is like less than 50% mid rates, okay? Now, this is a really key concept. So strong academics, great, you know, increase admissions chances up to 3x, strong non-academics, right? The essays increase your admissions chances up to 10x. And that's where you need to focus, all right? So how does this break down? I'm gonna really talk about this for a minute because this is really important as we talk about when do essays matter, when do essays not matter? Every single dot you see here is 10 applicants, okay? So we put this on the chart. Uh, and what you find is, is that for a highly selective institution, uh, less than 15% admission rate, basically 75% of admits are in this green category, all right? So you might have strong academics or exceptional academics, strong or exceptional personal scores, okay? Uh, but there's still the 25% of other people admits that come from these other categories. Uh, but this sufficient, sufficient category where you see academic score right in the middle and personal score right in the middle, uh, that's like 0.1% of acceptances and probably is mainly like legacies or athletes or you know stuff that's probably not applicable to you in many cases, right? So you have to, you know, really like, if you can get to that strong personal score, it's really important because it's also really hard for you to understand or evaluate whether or not you actually have a strong academic score. Okay, because they don't release a lot of that information, <laughs> you know, at, at Harvard and, and all these institutions. It's really hard to tell, um, you know, how you're performing. Now, how does this change, right? So as admission rate increases and as class size increases, you can start dipping down deeper into the applicant pool. So in many cases, now essays may start mattering a little less because if you have really strong academics, you might just get accepted even if your essays are not great, such as Georgia Tech, right? Georgia Tech has a similar number of applicants every year to Harvard, but they accept a lot more students, right? That makes sense. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, essays, your essays really matter a lot for highly selective colleges, selective colleges where 15 to 50% admit rate where your academics might be sufficient, but not strong compared to other applicants. This also really matters for large colleges where you're applying to highly desirable programs, especially like engineering or computer science programs, uh, or very desirable out-of-state destinations, okay? So one thing to realize is when you're applying for, let's say, the University of Washington, you're not applying to the University of Washington. You're actually applying to a specific college or program within the University of Washington. And if you're applying to your computer science department, way harder to get into uh, because they only have a certain number of seats at that computer science department uh, and they have a lot of very strong applicants to the computer science department. Their admissions rates are far lower and the academic profile of those students is far greater uh, than would be um, for other potentially other programs. This is similar to like Carnegie Mellon. Uh, this is similar to uh, many, many, many uh, you know institutions that kind of accept into different pools of, of uh, you know, uh, kind of programs or majors. And essays matter less, right? For selective colleges, still, 
where your academics might be strong compared to other applicants, right? You may not know how strong they are, which is why we would say, just put your best foot forward with all of your essays and everything else that you need to do for your applications. But like, as I said, Georgia Tech, you can still get in with maybe not some not great essays as long as you have really strong academics. Uh, it's possible that's because their class sizes are much bigger. Uh, and also like essays matter less for large colleges where you're applying in state uh, or you're applying to less competitive programs, right? Uh, the essays may matter a bit less and that's fine. Um, and so, and as I said, like always really your goal is you might as well put, invest the time. You might as well do a really good job with the essays process, you know, the essay process. Okay. So, uh, wait, Brett, Go there's a, a good question about, um, besides the essay, what else might contribute to that personal score? And, um, I don't know if they want to maybe just, yeah, so it's, I mean, it's, yeah, it's basically, it's the essay. And when I say essay, I really mean like content. Well, that's what I was going to say. Maybe you want yeah. to explain. It's like, it's yeah, the so like, we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah. But, but it really has not a lot, has a lot less to do with like the writing that you do, but rather the content and clarity of the writing that you have. Uh, number one, uh, your activities list, which is also involves writing about your activities, um, your additional information section, which is also written. Uh, it's your interview, uh, if a school has one, which only a few schools really do. Uh, and it's your recommendations. Okay. All of that kind of gets coupled together as a single score. All right. Um, and you tend to get a score on, it's not like you get a score on your common app essay on each individual essay, you get like one collective score basically uh, across all of these components basically together in most cases. All right. Um, so how many essays are you going to have to write? And this is kind of shocking, I think, for a lot of people if they have if you haven't had a student go through the admissions uh, process recently. Um, but um, you know, most students are writing kind of this what we call this personal statement essay, which is the most common version of that is the Common App essay. So it's a 650 word essay that you use across multiple institutions. All right, and even if you're applying to less selective colleges, which is great, there's a lot of colleges that are. Uh, you know, greater than 50% admissions rates that offer amazing educations, like Virginia Tech, for example, um, I think Texas A&M, just like so many, right? Um, but the, uh, the ones that are less selective tend to have less essays involved in the application process. So you still may need to write this like common application essay, or you might not need to write any essays. You're still going to have to do an activities list. You're still optionally going to include additional information if you desire to do that. Uh, but these institutions may not have supplemental. So these extra essays that you need to write for each individual school. Okay. Once you start getting into selective colleges, which is roughly speaking around 200 or so institutions uh, in the United States, uh, you're probably, and you're applying to multiple of those, you're probably writing five to 20 total essays across all of your applications. You still have to do that personal statement we just talked about, activities list, additional information, but you start having these supplemental essays, like why do you want to apply to this school? Um, what major do you want to do and why? Describe an act, your like most meaningful activity or work experience and why. Like these are really common essays that you may need to write uh, for some and, of these. And Brad, I'm just kind of curious what your opinion is about the fact, like um, you know, the Common App, right? All the schools are looking at that personal essay. Um, but how much weight does the personal essay might have versus the supplemental essays? Because sometimes. Sometimes the supplement. Like, yeah, just so it's it's a great it's a great question, and the answer is all essays matter. Okay, uh, because you're not getting a score on your Common App essay. Like, oh, that's a great Common App essay. You know, let me give that a ten out of ten, right? And then they go to the the YS essay, and they're like, ah, oh, that's not so great. Maybe I'll give it a two out of three, right, or something. No, that's not how it works. Um, you know, they're kind of looking at it holistically. So all of the different essays and pieces of the application basically need to fit together to tell like a narrative that's going to prove that you're going to be successful. And I'll just throw out this tidbit. We did a Facebook Live last summer with a, a former admissions officer from Dartmouth College. And she basically said, you know, when she looks at an application and all the pieces, she could tell kind of when the student didn't put as much effort into the supplemental essays and it just kind of it you know it kind of, it said something to them yeah i was doing a, a similar de um dean in admission at richmond i was doing an event with him and he's like look i know when i'm reading the application and the supplement i can kind of tell that it was maybe written the night before and that's just like a big turnoff and it's like a leads to uh rejections right 
Um, and so this is really important. Like all the essays, every single component of the application that you're putting in there needs to be, they're looking at that collectively, right? Um, and so don't just think, hey, I'm gonna do really well in the personal statement because it works across every single application. Every single thing that you send to each school really matters. It matters a lot, okay? And, oh, sorry, one other question, because somebody's asking, it's a good, um, they're, they're asking kind of, um, you know, we've, we've laid out here um, how many essays a student might have to write, but we haven't really actually explained how many colleges they might be applying to, which therefore um, generates these number of essays. And yeah, yeah, so this is like, I'm using kind of like the typical number, so like 10-ish. Right, but the, uh, I only wanted to, I mean, it's a good question and your, your answer is fair, but I want to point out to families that, you know, and this is out of our control to some extent, but the system of what has happened over the past, you know, two years because of test optional is that um, more students are applying to more schools. And so the there's just been um, more applications in, in the system um, and it's a it's a bad trend, but it's not something that yeah, you can it's, it's actually it's been a trend for multiple decades now, and uh, all the COVID stuff basically just expedited the trend. Exactly. So all highly selective institutions basically are now have forty to fifty percent more applications per year than they were getting uh, in twenty nineteen. Okay, or the or I guess yeah. So in twenty 2020, twenty twenty one, they received. 50% more applications, roughly speaking. And a lot of other just selective institutions, they're up like 20% uh, to 30%. So it's it's way up, um, you know, so I'm saying about 10 applications, you might be writing this number of essays. Uh, it used to be, I would always say like six to eight applications is what was kind of more normal to do. Back when I applied to school, I only applied to four uh, institutions. So you know, it, it's just like extrapolated and you kind of have to because um, to some degree, because like admissions is really difficult out there. And we see a lot of students don't get into certain institutions that you would think they would get into. And it's for a variety of reasons. Like the college thinks that, oh, we're not sure if this student's actually going to attend here if we accept them, uh, in which case they want to not accept the student because then it hurts if they accept them, it hurts their numbers. It hurts what's called yield. And so these are all things that schools have to think about because they don't wanna negatively impact their US news rankings. Because moving down like a couple of rankings on the US news is you could lose hundreds of millions of dollars uh, basically um, as a school. So there, there's a lot of different aspects in play here. And they're mostly like selfish reasons first by schools than, than any of your fault whatsoever. Right. Uh, but this is just kind of how the admissions process works and they all have different priorities and they never really tell you what their priorities are in a given year, okay? Because admissions officers don't like to, you to know their priorities. They just want you to, they just want to get as many applications in as they can, except whoever they want uh, and not have, to, not have to answer to anyone, right? That, that, that's basically what admissions officers want to do. Uh, so for highly selective schools, uh, and, you know, I'm saying under 15% admit rates, but you're seeing admit rates kind of go down and down. Um, many of these students are writing 20, 40, 50 essays, okay? Now, that sounds like a lot because it is, uh, but the nice part is, is that much of the content over time just overlaps, okay? So while it's, oftentimes you can't use the exact same essay for each institution, um, you can use like versions of it, okay? Um, and so on and so forth. Uh, and most of the colleges you apply to in that situation have at least one supplemental essay. So one shorter essay or one, uh, you know, Cornell's case, they have one extra 650 word essay, but some have eight essays. Okay. Well, not just that. It's not just the supplemental essays. And it also depends if your student is applying to the honors program. Yeah. The honors program of extra essays, engineering programs, a lot of times have extra essays. Um, sometimes schools have school specific scholarships that have extra essays. Yep all of these things really start adding up and adding up very quickly. Um, and what you wanna do is basically, as I said, you're almost telling kind of a narrative or your entire, here's the profile, here's how I want to present my brand, my personal brand to the school. And all of those components basically need to fit uh, together um, to a large degree, okay? All right, so once again, remember uh, the purpose of the college application is to prove that your student will be successful in college and beyond. So what does that mean? Um, so let's get into like, what are, what are they actually looking for? What are the very specific things that they're actually looking for in, in these essays? Um, 
And this leads me to the single biggest myth in all of essay dem or all of application dem uh, for college apps is that essays are about telling your story. And we have a fun article that's literally a bunch of quotes from admissions deans that basically said, all we want to know is your story. You know, essays tell your story. It's just like quote after quote after quote. We just want to get to know you. And it's like, guess what? Those are not necessarily lies, but they're incomplete information. Okay. Because essays are really about telling your story that proves that you'll be successful in college and beyond. This is the critical element. And we see students over and over and over and over again that just say, hey, I'm just supposed to tell my story. Oh, I'm supposed to tell a story. They're telling the wrong stories. They're telling the stories that are not compelling to the admissions officers, not what their admissions officers are looking for at all. Okay. What they're looking for is your experiences and you to write about your experiences that will prove that you will be successful in college and beyond. And how you do that um, is through five traits, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but first, we'll just say it's like, look, this also matters. Every essay is important. We already talked about this. Every piece of your application is important because together they prove that success. So here's the five traits that colleges are looking for in applicants. You, or your student rather, does not necessarily need to cover all five of these traits on your application or in every single essay. You wanna focus on your two to three big strengths, okay? I'm gonna talk about each of these five traits. Um, I'm sure we'll probably send these traits out to everyone. You can take some copious notes if you want. You can go grab your kit if you want. Uh, you know, this is, this is really important information and we always get uh, a lot of people asking about it. Um, but basically here's the five things that uh, college uh, admissions officers are looking for in applicants. The first is drive, okay? So these are students that push themselves to succeed no matter how long the odds, they're going through difficult situations and always coming out a better person as a result of it. Why does drive matter, okay? You're gonna run into challenging situation or your student's gonna run into challenging situations in college and in life, okay? And students that are driven are gonna get through those challenging situations. They're gonna be more successful as a result of going through those challenges. Many college admissions officers call this grit, okay? There's actually like an entire consortium of uh, admissions deans that get together, I think once a year to talk about college admissions. Uh, and the number one thing they always kind of, there's a report that they put out uh, and it's like, hey, we really care about grit, okay? Also known as drive. Uh, I was talking to the Dean of Admissions at MIT a few years ago. Uh, and what he was saying was, yep, we're talking about the five traits, love the five traits. And number one thing that he's looking for is students in, an, in a pool of extremely driven applicants. He's looking for students that are unusually driven. So even more driven than the most driven students, right? That exist in the country. That's like who he's trying to identify within these essays uh, and within the applications, okay? So this is really important, drive. Uh, probably the, the number one trait. The second is intellectual curiosity. So these are students that love learning just for the fun of it in their free time to gain a deeper understanding of the subjects and topics in which they're interested in, all right? Now, a lot of students, if you ask them, they'll say, oh, the, you know, I'm not really interested in anything. You know, I, I don't really like do any learning on my own, false. The vast majority of students have something they're really excited about, really gets them going, and they just don't realize that colleges will find that compelling. Way back in the day when I applied for college, I had no idea about any of this stuff. Uh, fortunately, it was like in, what was that? I was applying in 2002, right? So, you know, it was like, so nobody really knew this stuff. Um, and, uh, and I had no idea about this. And it turns out like I had like self-studied for AP exams and took AP exams that my school didn't even offer, which I guess is a little easier nowadays. Like I literally had to read a textbook and, and take them, right? Back in the day. I didn't even mention this on my applications at all, right? Uh, I didn't know that that was something they would really care about. And guess what? Yeah, they probably saw the AP score, but they probably didn't like look at my transcript to see if I actually took that exam, right? Uh, I mean, took that class. Uh, so I didn't spell it out for them. Uh, I didn't spell out that I was like a self-learner, really intellectually curious. Um, but this is something that is a trait that colleges really look for, so much so that Emory University, for example, uh, they call their personal score intellectual curiosity. Okay, that's how much they care about. There's actually an essay, a famous supplemental essay that Stanford has uh, that is about intellectual curiosity. This is how much schools care about this. The third is initiative. So these are students not willing to accept the status quo, they're very entrepreneurial. No matter what situation or group of people that they're a part of, 
there might be identifying something that's not quite right or could be made better. And not are they just identifying it, they're acting on making it better. Okay, they're solving it and making it better. And schools love these types of students because these are the leaders, right? These are the people that go in and make uh, you know, everyone around better and make the institution better and all that sort of stuff. The fourth is contribution. So these are students that no matter what group of people that they're a part of, that group of people is better as a result of their being there, okay? These are sometimes like the super connectors, the people that everybody loves. And colleges love these students because on campus, these are the connective tissue of the campus. This is like how the community functions. This is how, you know, a huge reason why, you know, schools are charging insane amounts of money to attend them, right? We won't even name the amounts of money. Uh, but they're doing that because a lot of it's not just about the learning, it's about the community, right? So they want to make sure they're fostering and building a great community and the contributors are really strong for that. And the final one is diversity of experiences. So they want students to learn from each other. They want to, them to share their life experiences together and ways of thinking about the world to add unique perspectives to the student body and help people kind of develop their own opinions on like what's going on in the world, okay? Uh, and so th that's also really important. Uh, in terms of like, how are they evaluating applicants, okay? As I said, you want maybe two or three of these really to shine through as strengths in your application. You might touch on all five, uh, you don't have to, uh, but once again, they're looking for students that like have not just well-rounded across all five of these, but real strengths, like real spikes that they're you're like unusually driven or unusually intellectually curious, right? That's what they're trying to evaluate in this, okay? And what's really interesting about this is that notice that everything we're talking about here relates to your experience, your students' experiences. Okay, that's how they prove that they're going to be successful. It has nothing to do with the, the uh, beauty of their writing, essentially, right? It has to do with the content, okay? Now, we always get this question. Uh, so I've decided to include it actually in the, uh, the actual presentation now, <laughs> because we always get it at the end or Debbie asked me or somebody yeah. asked me, right? Um, what are good topics and bad topics? Okay. And the answer is, there's no such thing as a bad topic for an essay, provided it relates to one or more of these five traits. Okay. Um, now I will say there's some topics that are harder to relate to these five traits for sure. Right. So a lot of students write about like band, athletics, drama, or slash theater, um, that sort of thing, those types of activities. Well, those are non-academic related activities. And so just writing about how much you love music is not that exciting. It doesn't prove that you're going to be successful in college and beyond. But a lot of times, you know, the setting of your essay may be banned, but the essay is actually about leadership or contribution or, um, you know, drive, right? Or intellectual curiosity in some way, right? So it actually, you can tie those to different traits. Like for athletes, for example, uh, we see a lot of things where it's like, oh, you know, I was in the championship game. I was really tired, but I dug down deep and I scored the game winning goal. That doesn't prove you're going to be successful in college and beyond. But if that essay turns around and that scoring the game winning goal is the result of a ton of hard work that the student had put in ahead of time, not just during practice with the team, but outside of practice with the team, maybe like studying YouTube videos on Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi's moves, practicing those moves. And it just so happened to be at the most critical moment of the season, you had to dig down deep. You used one of those moves and you actually scored, okay, the game winning goal. Now, all of a sudden, hey, here's this wonderful essay about drive and intellectual curiosity that all of a sudden proves that you are driven and intellectually curious because it led to a specific result, okay? That can be a really compelling version of an athletics essay versus, hey, I just enjoy being on the team, right? That type of thing, okay? So this is really important, just these five traits. And then the other thing is that with all of the content across your entire application, right? The content that you have is the number one most important thing. That's what you're being evaluated on. And then clarity and readability. Because if you're an admissions officer on the eight minutes that they spend on average evaluating your entire application, if they can't understand it very easily, they're not going to probably put in the effort to figure it out, okay? They're not going to put in the effort to like tie together all the pieces for you, 
Um, don't rely on the admissions officer to do that. Do that for them, right? Wrap it up in a nice bow, right? Be like, yep, Sally is the greatest student. She's going to fit really well in here. And you're just like, they're just like, accept, okay? And that comes with the clarity and the readability of the writing. It has very little to do with creativity and beautiful prose. Okay, so most of the example essays, if you look them up, you see them online, they're going to be like these beautifully written things with like these analogies about like Costco and um, you know, all sorts of other analogies and things. Um, and guess what? That if you actually look at those essays and you have an admissions officer look at them, they will point out, here's the actual reasons why the student got in and they have nothing to do with the analogy and metaphor at the top. Okay. Uh, and so a lot of people and a lot of students they're fo and a lot of people that are helping your students with their essays are going to focus on the wrong things. They're going to focus on tell your story. They're going to focus on creativity. They're going to focus on beautiful prose. They're not going to focus on the stuff that really matters, content related to the five traits, clarity and readability, right? Those are the things. Those are the things that get you in and we have the results to back that up, right? Uh, that's what gets you in. And, and by the way, that's what admissions officers say too. Like they want stuff that's they care about the content, they care about clarity, they care about the readability. Yeah, you know, some of them are like, when you ask them like, hey, what's the most memorable essay that you've ever read? They're gonna usually say one that was pretty creative because those are the ones that are easier to remember. But guess what? That's not the thing that got you in. I've heard admissions officers tell me about great essays they've seen and the student didn't even, they, they didn't even accept the student, right? Because it was the creativity. And it's like, well, you dive in deeper and you're like, oh yeah, that was a really creative essay, but I didn't really learn anything about the student. Right. I didn't prove they were going to be successful in college and beyond. It was just like a nicely written essay. That's all. All right. So what's the best application process? What should you do? How should you go through this? Uh, and right after this, I'm going to talk a little bit about prompts. We're going to take some questions. We're going to look at some examples of essays. So, oh, Brad, I'm just curious. Do you feel uh, the, I'm just going to say the word burrito. Are you going to do that? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Essay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, you know, creativity is helpful, but we're actually going to take a look at like a creative essay that uh, when you actually look at it, you'd be like, oh, this is really creative. And then I just want like, to give oh. people a sense of still what's coming. Cause it, yeah, yeah. Not, like we, yeah. we have like an essay coming and we're going to show like a first draft. We're going to show the final version. And you're going to be like, wow, this is completely different. Right. Uh, and this is really important. So how should you do this? What is like the best application process to actually go through? Okay. The answer is like, get started in May. Okay like right after maybe AP exams are, are over if your students are taking those, okay? Uh, and the key is what you want to start with is you want to plan your content you're going to use across all of your applications. This is how we start with all students, right? It's not about like, hey, let me figure out what I'm going to write about for my Common App essay. That's not step one. Step one is figure out all of the content that you need to include on each application. And why do you do that in May? You do that in May because you can identify where there's gaps. You can identify things that the student can do over the summer that are gonna greatly improve uh, the content that they're gonna have in their application, okay? This is very important, right? So get, get started now, do this, you know, more or less in the next few weeks, right? Like this is important. Uh, and the reason for that is we see a lot of students like a few weeks before the deadline, they're like, oh yeah, I wanna write about my mission trip we went, I went on. It was so meaningful to me, right? I went to, you know, Ecuador and, you know, I, I made a sidewalk for, for students, right? And, you know, it really, like, it, it really impacted me. And my question is always like, oh, that's nice. So what? Like, how have you changed? How, once you got back from that, has your life changed to the point where you have now taken actions as a result of something you learned about yourself? And then the students are, most of the time, are like, yeah, I didn't really do anything. Right? Nothing really changed. I'm saying my mindset changed, but my actions didn't change, okay? This is why you have this conversation now. So you could take a look at, here's all the really important content. Here's the stuff that really matters to the student. And then we can identify, and we help students identify, here's some things that maybe you should be thinking about doing over the summer to do self-learning about different subjects you're involved with, that sort of thing. Because this is the last opportunity to really spend some time where you can actually greatly improve your content and your admissions chances of getting into that strong personal category, okay? So that's one. Two is write your Common App essay, just get it done July or June or July. When we work with students, it's like one to two weeks uh, and they're done, okay? Then you wanna complete your application for usually your top choice school, okay? You wanna do this before school starts. All of the admissions essay, all the supplemental essays are released uh, by the beginning of August. Some of the schools release them earlier. 
Uh, and what you want to do is work application by application because you take all the content that you want to include in that application and match it up with all the different components of that application. So you make sure everything that you want to cover is covered. Okay. Uh, you finish that app, then you go to the next two applications and do those. And then you final and you want to do your basically your your top three choices of schools. And maybe you don't know exactly where you're going to apply, but you might have a decent idea of it by by the time you know senior year rolls around, the start of it. Get at least three applications done. Because once you've done that, now all of a sudden it's like, okay, most of the rest of the applications you write are basically matching content that you've already written to the new application and modifying it, okay? That's a huge part of that. And you wanna make sure everything gets done within two weeks of the deadline. Uh, Debbie, do you remember what the stat is for uh, the percentage of students that submit their common app applications within 48 hours of the deadline? Do you remember that? Uh, no, I don't know that, but I'm no. sure it's really it's more high. More than 90%. Okay, don't be that student. And let, let me just say, and this is not unusual. There have been in the past few years glitches, you know, with um with the, with the Common App system, with the with the college specific system. Um, there have been weather conditions that have you know um you know the, taken electricity down, you know. So um, yeah. sometimes the schools are lenient, sometimes they're not. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of times they are, but it still creates a lot of stress. Yeah. At number one. But number two is, is that if you're just filling out the application right before the deadline, you may actually be surprised because a lot of times there's essays that are kind of hidden in some of these applications, or you may not realize that you need to write or something that you need to do. And then you're scrambling at the last minute. Don't do that. Uh, Cause anytime you're doing that, you're probably going to end up with a worse result. Okay. Um, so if you follow this process, which when we work with students, vast majority do, uh, they're just kind of enjoying their senior year, the students and the parents are enjoying the student's senior year, right? It's kind of your last year in some cases with your student. Uh, and uh, so you might as well enjoy it, right? Get the applications done early, reduce the stress and uh, go from there, okay? All right, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about prompts. We'll do the burrito essay coming up, um, all that sort of fun stuff, bunch of Q and A. I'll stick around for as long as people want me to do Q&A for, um, uh, although some of you will drop off, but I'm, I'm happy to stick around. Uh, but here's the reason why you should work with a coach, okay? Your goal is one, stop worrying. Two, work smarter, not harder, okay? And that's why you use work with us, okay? Your goal is to have applications you and your student are confident in, right? That you know that admissions officers will really like. Um, you wanna actually complete, your students to complete their applications well in advance of deadlines. We are nudging students along the way uh, to make sure they get stuff done. Uh, and you want to save time and reduce conflict, right? We see all the time people coming to us where the parent and the students are really you know, in major conflict over the essays and the essay topics that they're writing about, the parents trying to provide feedback on essays, or the aunts trying to provide feedback on the essay, or the teacher saying one thing, the counselor saying something else, uh, the parents saying something else, the student wants to do something else. And at the end of the day, usually nobody's right. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's kind of what ends up happening, right? And so it really helps to work with somebody that's like, okay, let's let's uh, you know take you through the beginning to the end of the process and guide you through that entire thing. Saves the student a ton of time, usually half the time or more uh, of what they would otherwise be spending. Uh, and uh, you know, it's kind of like short circuiting like the entire process, right? Uh, working with an expert, right? It's a little bit about us. Uh, we're the highest rated. Uh, college application and essay coaching company uh, on Trustpilot, 4.9 out of five stars. We get great results. Three and four students we work with get into one or more of their reach colleges, not target colleges. I mean, reach where it's like highly selective or the student is below the kind of uh, median academic uh, profile of an admitted student uh, at that institution. Uh, and nearly everyone gets into at least one or reach your target college. We have no control over where you want to apply. You can apply wherever you want. Um, so, you know, these are pretty good stats considering, considering we, we, we provide no guidance basically on school lists. Okay. Um, that's the general gist of it. Uh, we've supported over 30,000 students over the years, 150,000 plus essays reviewed, 250 plus high schools actually recommend our services to students. Just to give you that sense, like we are a writing education company. High schools really like what we do, high school counselors, teachers, everyone. Uh, and we're really, uh, you know, we're, we're usually half the price or less of, of other options uh, and deliver great, great results. Okay. Um, all right. Um, 
Also, these are some of your essay coaches that you'll work with, top 2%, basically. We only accept 2% of the thousands of applicants we get per year, and they go through a very rigorous training process that takes more than 20 hours. Uh, how we work together, you have two cho choices. Uh, you can work one-on-one -on -one with us. We assign you an application advisor and a writing coach. Um, you receive unlimited support on what you've bought, so how many video calls you need to do, chatting with us, written feedback that you receive. Uh, we take you from before you've even thought about what you're going to write till you're done with your apps, okay? Your application advisor keeps you on track, your student on track, right? Their job is to make sure your student gets their applications done well in advance of their deadlines and answer any questions that they have along the way. Uh, and your writing coach actually helps the student plan their content and revise every component of the application, all right? Uh, that includes not just the essays, but the activities list and uh, additional information section. Uh, we also have these really cool small group boot camps up to eight students per group. Uh, this is for the personal statement. Uh, so like the common application essay, uh, there's two one and a half hour sessions. I think we have one scheduled for uh, kind of the end of May-ish timeframe, kind of after AP exams. Um, and you can sign on for, and each of the students receives two rounds of written feedback on their drafts during that process. So the goal is, hey, within a week, you know, a little bit more than a week, uh, your student is done uh, with their personal statement essay. All right. So those are kind of the two ways uh, that we that we work with students. Uh, we support many thousands of students uh, every year, hundreds for Road to College. Um, and uh, you can go to prompt.com slash road to college and uh, you can see some of the options there. I, we have discounts running through through Sunday on our one on one coaching, which is uh, just on the personal statement. So the beginning to the end of the personal statement, planning everything uh, till when you're done writing it. Uh, you can start that at any time. So you can buy now and then pick a start date later. You can definitely do that. Um, you can buy now and kind of get onboarded with your application advisor uh, and then pick your start date. Those are those are options for you. And then the other big deal that we have, which is the best deal that we're going to have all year uh, for Road to College families uh, is on all schools. So support across every single school for, for uh, that you're applying to. Uh, in terms of like who picks what, um, generally speaking, students that are applying to at least one kind of highly selective type institution is usually getting like work with working with a coach where three schools or all their schools where we work from the beginning to the end of the process and all their applications for those uh, students that are applying to um, less selective institutions. A lot of times are, hey, let's go ahead and have a really good uh, common application essay. Maybe we'll buy a few individual reviews of other essays later. Uh, so you can kind of self optimize that. Uh, and most of those students are buying into the one on one. Uh, families are buying into the one-on-one -on -one program with us, uh, but a lot also to the small group boot camp. So roughly speaking, though, three times as many people pick the one-on-one -on -one coaching as, as the small group boot camp. Uh, both have great results. Uh, it just kind of depends on, on how you want to go through that. Um, tonight only, uh, you can get an extra $10 off everything. Uh, that's not listed on this screen, but when you go to prompt.com slash road to college, uh, it will have the extra $10 off listed for all of the options. You can just go there, uh, click uh, to, to make a purchase if you want to do that. Highly recommend doing it. You just take it off your plate and just be like, hey, I know applications are going to be great and done, right? Uh, and as I said, we support on essays, activities list, additional information section, kind of your personal brand and making sure that you get this, the essays done uh, on time. And, and just to be, just for clarity purpose, um, like the all schools one does basically, it's really helping the student with any writing that's related to the application. So obviously there's the main essay, there's the supplements, there's going over the activities list. It seems like, oh, the, that should be easy. It's actually really important to- it's, um, It really is. Way, the reason why it's important is that you actually have limited characters about what you can say um, for each activity. So um, there's that, sometimes there's a resume that, they, that, that schools ask for. And then of course, depending on the number of schools that your student is applying to and, and the potential of all the different um, supplements, um, that's, that's why you know, it's kind of an all encompassing option. Yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's literally everything. So any school specific uh, scholarship essays that gets included in there, uh, any major or program essays get in there. Uh, students that have portfolios that involve writing, like art, artist statements and stuff, that's included in there. Uh, it's really to make sure that you are, you know, kind of taken care of, you know, across the entire application process. Students that are going through that uh, are receiving, depending on the school list they're applying to, like 30 to 50 hours of like one-on-one -on -one time, just so you know. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite substantial. 
Um, a lot of the students are, you know, closer to 40 to 50 plus hours of one on one uh, time kind of through the process because there's just that much that that needs to be done. Uh, and it's really helpful to just have a guide there along the way. Uh, it saves a lot of time, make sure that everybody's really confident in the results that, that get submitted. And said the results that, that we have from working with students kind of speak for themselves, three and four get into at least one, you know, reach college uh, that they're working with. So um, Brad, just I'm just throwing this out to you and to everybody else. Um, uh, there are a fair number of questions. I don't know if we want to if you want to do the, the sample yeah. essay. It, yeah, so I'm going to do the sample essay. I'm going to pull that up right now. Um, just one thing before I do that, as I know a few people are dropping right now, um, there's something really cool that I wanted to show you all, which is like inside of the prompt uh, platform. So what we have here as your students get started is we actually have a list of every single essay for every single school. You just kind of add a school that, that you're applying to. Um, and uh, we add all of the essays that you need to write. Um, this is available even, even for free um, that you can get access to this um, one just by creating a, an account uh, with with prompt, um, but we can actually see all of the essays that the students need to write. You can see here that these are not done for this, you know, updated for this year, but they will be updated and you get notifications when your, your essays get updated. Uh, and we have a bunch of tools for kind of brainstorming essay content uh, and working on essay content that we use with our students as well. Uh, so we have this entire platform that, that we are working with and working engaging with students with. And we highly recommend uh, doing that uh, as well. Um, okay, so uh, Debbie, if there's any like questions that came up a bunch, we could take one or two of those if you think they're really important. Now I'm also going to pull up the uh, one of the essays. So this is actually an important question. I think yeah. it actually will also relate to as you're reviewing the this um particular this essay. Uh, it was really early on. Somebody asked. Uh, how do you help your student, but make sure that their voice is authentic and that it doesn't become, you know, it doesn't sound like they've been, they've, they've like worked with a professional or, you know, that it's yeah. still, still their, their, their own story. Yeah. I think that, the, you know, the critical thing here is, is that, you know, as a parent, you don't write the stuff for kids. And as coaches, we don't write the stuff for the students. Okay. So the key is, is to guide the student during the planning process, number one. And then in the feedback process, we're making sure that really focusing on how can we further improve content? How can we fit more stuff within the essays? Clarity and readability. Okay. So it's not about like, hey, let's go in and rewrite a bunch of sentences for students. It's rather, okay, here's sentences that maybe you can delete. Here's sentences that maybe you can combine to make a bunch of stuff shorter, right? Uh, and fit more content within, right? Here's ways to break up sentences such that it's gonna be clear. Here's how you can restructure some things such that it improves readability and clarity of the points that you're trying to get across. Um, so all the students that we work with, and you'll see that in this essay as well, is like the voice really does shine through. <clears throat> and oftentimes like, you know, an essay that the student produced that they're very confident in is probably not exactly how we would have written it for sure. Okay. And sometimes contains elements where like, ah, that's, you know, maybe not the best thing, but the student really wanted to keep it in. Right. It's, and ultimately it's their choice. And to some degree, like it doesn't need to be perfect anyways. Um, so, you know, it's really about content and making those messages come across. So we're going to take a look at this example right now where you're going to see pretty clearly that this student's like voice kind of between this first draft and the final draft is there but the content and the clarity and the readability are so much stronger, okay? Uh, and we're gonna talk about what matters within this essay related to the five traits and what doesn't, all right, cool. I'm gonna read this out loud. I'm gonna read, then read the final, I'll talk about it for a minute, then read the final version out loud, um, and then we'll take a bunch of additional questions as needed, all right? Uh, and I recommend as I'm doing this, if you want, you can, uh, cause I'm gonna read it out loud, uh, you can hang out on the prompt.com slash road to college, check that out. Uh, we have people actually, uh, if you have any questions there about anything, we, some of our team are available actually on the chat or you can make, have actually call us this evening if you wanna make sure you're getting that $10 discount and you have some questions. Okay, cool. So this is a, a student. Uh, she was, um, I just have to say she, cause most people actually, if I ask the gender of who do you think wrote this, most people think it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a boy. So I just have to uh, say she. Uh, and she uh, ended up at the University of Michigan, uh, but 
she was also accepted at like UNC, UC Berkeley, uh, Cornell, a bunch of other institutions as well. Uh, and, you know, she had, I would say, a decent academic profile, but it was not, um, you know, necessarily the strongest that, you know, compared to, you know, other applicants. Okay. Well, I always refer to this as the burrito essay because it's about a burrito. All right. So looking down, I saw the pieces of shredded pork starting to fall out of the gaping hole. The woman gawked at me from the other side of the bar as I tried to think of an excuse. Her choice of fillings was awful. How could she expect me to wrap over two scoops of three cheese queso and shredded pork without at least half the filling squirted out? I'm new. I blurted using the same excuse I had given at least 50 previous customers. I can see, she replied, and awkward silence followed. I knew I had to save her dead burrito. It was my second week at my summer job at Qdoma Mexican Grill, and I had my lumpy, soggy burritos were a daily routine. I couldn't understand why I struggled so much with making burritos when I was succeeding in a tough course load. I understood the first part of folding it like a dumpling, but rolling the burrito was a whole other story. No matter how hard I tried, the burrito would rip open, fall apart, squirt out liquid, or better yet, all three as an end result. It was horrendous. I used to cringe every time someone asked me for a burrito because I knew that the end result was not going to be pretty. This was my hardest burrito yet. Instead of freezing up and shoving the mess into another worker like I always did before, I forced myself to continue despite her angry glare. Quickly heating another tortilla, I transferred the contents to the lower half so I could save more room to roll over. After lifting the cover, I finally noticed the sogginess was coming from the pica de gallo and beans. After draining, I tried to make it quickly, but my heavy-handed pressure caused it to rip open. I tried again with gentle fingers, but it just fell apart. Taking a deep breath and with shaking hands, I tried another method, forwarding horizontally with firm pressure. To my delight, it stayed. Rolling the burrito, I wrapped the orange foil over and gave it to the customer, chiming, thank you, enjoy. I almost saw a hint of a smile on her face before she left. That was my proudest moment all year. Beginning Since the beginning, I dreaded how the burrito would decide to turn on me. But looking at the obstacle as a fun challenge helped me make a burrito I could actually serve to my customers. It was no way perfect, but who can make a perfect burrito? Instead of thinking I couldn't do this because of potential problems, I changed my mindset to I will try my best and if mistakes happen, that's just a natural part of the process. Just like the different, the different burritos I have made, I will encounter many different challenges that I will need to adapt to. Even though the bigger challenges carry greater potential for mistakes, the reward is much greater, not just for me, but for other people. Sometimes the whole process is just as if not more rewarding than the end product. Working for the answer is more enjoyable than having it automatically given to me. I never underestimate a potential challenge, no matter how small, because those may even be the hardest to stay focused on. I look at mistakes as opportunities to grow and find a better way. I look forward to challenges, big or small, that I will face not just college, but life. Training the distractions and little problems will help me overcome challenges more easily. How can I teach my, adjust my teaching so people can understand what glomotophoritis and projectile motion are? What does the eight mile Kensington bike path continue? Life is going to throw many more lumpy burritos at me, but I know what the next step will be. All right. So this is a really common type of essay that we get, not necessarily because it's related to a burrito, but rather it's telling a story. Okay. And then pontificating on a bunch of stuff like waxing philosophical about things uh, that, you know, you're not really proving to me that you have uh, done a lot of stuff related to this uh, and just really common. Okay. So I get a little bit of, okay, maybe the student's driven, you know, maybe they're a little bit of a problem solver, who knows, right. But I'm not getting a lot kind of out of the essay. And so this is what happens very commonly when a student is kind of, uh, you know, this student didn't do any of the planning process for essays with us. They just kind of came with the first draft. Apparently, the student had spent many, many hours, you know, tens of hours working on this draft and then said, hey, I want to submit it to the, to the prompt team and get their feedback on it. Okay. Now, when we provide feedback on essays, we don't just provide feedback on grammar. Okay. So this is like what the feedback looked like on this essay. So it's basically an entire essay or more of feedback on how to improve this. Uh, and so what we do is we talk about what do we learn about the student? Uh, what didn't we learn that we actually wanted to learn about the student? And then here's a structure for improving the essay, like an example outline that the student can actually then work from, okay? Um, after several drafts, so about three drafts of their essay and working, you know, probably spending an extra you know, four or five hours on it themselves, they reached uh, out for kind of uh, with this final version. We actually never got the real final version of the essay, um, but this was kind of the last version that we had seen from them. Okay. 
So I'm going to go ahead and read this now. Uh, and one of the key issues with that previous essay was we actually spent, you know, roughly two thirds to three quarters of the workout on the burrito story. And at the end, she started talking about teaching glomerulonephritis, like stuff that was kind of, hey, how does this relate? That sounds kind of interesting. Uh, and so she was able to expand upon a lot of this and tie burritos to other actions that she was willing to take. All right, so let's dive in. The pieces of shredded pork started to fall out of, the gape of a gaping hole. The woman gawked at me from the other side of the counter. How could she expect me to wrap over two scoops of three cheese queso and shredded pork without at least half the filling squirting out? I'm new, I stuttered for the 13th time that day. It was an excuse for my continued failure. I had been on the job at Qdoba Mexican Grill for three weeks and my lumpy soggy burritos were a daily humiliation. I couldn't understand why making a burrito was so hard when I had no trouble with calculus problems and memorizing hundreds of parts in anatomy. During wrapping, the burrito would rip open, fall apart, squirt out liquid on the worst days. I fell victim to all three. But at that moment, I mentally decided, that's it. I'm going to solve this problem and figure out how to wrap a burrito. I forced myself to continue despite the two glaring eyes that watched my every fold. Quickly heating another tortilla, I transferred the contents to the lower half so I could make more room to fold over. I noticed the sogginess was coming not from the pico, draining the pico de gallo, well, beans and pico de gallo well enough. So I wiped off the excess moisture. Then I tried a different wrapping method, a horizontal fold. To my delight, it stayed. Rolling the burrito, I wrapped over the orange foil and gave it to the customer, chiming, thank you, enjoy. I must saw a hint of a smile on her face before she left. After that day, I continued to find little improvements in my burrito making career and happily helped a new worker named Jasmine with properly positioning and smearing the guacamole and wrapping it over. From successfully making different burritos, I learned that persistence in studying the problem from different angles is the best approach for helping me improve. I just thought I thought I was just naturally good at calculus and anatomy, but even trying a different approach to calculus helps me solve the problem more efficiently. Anyone can learn anything as long as they set their mind to it. I now look at mistakes as opportunities to grow and find a better method. I look forward to future challenges that I might have to solve using different methods. Training little problems will also help me is more easily create a solution. As health occupations students of America, HOSA pathophysiology team leader, my responsibility is helping my team members learn about diseases and preparing them for competitions. I used to provide written notes from the book, but I saw that many of them struggled to understand glomerulonephritis because it is so similar to other urinary diseases like nephritis. I decided to test new approaches and to teach the material. I matched pictures with diseases, made a polycystic kidney using bur bubble paper and played a be the doctor game. I discovered that learning with written notes and memorization worked for me, but that interactive learning through games provided both my team and members and me with a deeper understanding of the material. My strategy made an impact. My team scores went from 60% to 90% on quizzes, and two of my teammates placed as finalists at the state leadership conference. Burritos and Hosa taught me to look at problems with different viewpoint and work together with others to achieve goals. As a doctor, I may have to use different approaches to an underlying problem. For example, I might you have to use a cardiogram or Doppler cardiography just to find a tiny clot in the heart that could be affecting the whole body. I also need to work together with the patient to find the best treatment. Life is gonna throw lumpy burritos at me, but I know how to improve. All right, so this is a step change improvement over the last essay. There's still parts of this that I don't really like very much, to be perfectly honest. Um, for example, this entire paragraph, I would probably have just cut, uh, but you know, the student's choice, right? And she wanted to leave it in and she thought that was really important, uh, for her, right? She still got into all the schools that we talked about, right? So, uh, and a very competitive program in particular, uh, at, at Michigan, uh, and she's probably now on her way to studying to be, uh, you know, a doctor in medical school or something, right? But what's really cool about what she did, right, is number one, the entire burrito story is now way shorter and way clearer, this line here that I'm gonna solve this problem and figure out how to wrap a burrito provides foreshadowing of what's to come, okay? So now I know that this essay is kind of about solving problems. Um, another thing that's really important is helping a new worker named Jasmine, okay? That's showing some contribution, some teamwork, some initiative, right? Um, then we're moving into, okay, this health occupations pathophysiology team leader. The single most important line in the entire essay is this, and this wasn't here before, right? She didn't even talk about this entire experience before. But the fact is, is that what she did is not as important as the impact that she had. And she, her team scores went from 60 to 90% and two of her teammates placed as finalists. That's really impressive. So just telling me, here's kind of what I did. Oh, that's nice. But oh, actually, wow, that really had an impact. She really did something really meaningful, okay? 
huge, huge. This is the single most important part of the essay. And that's the thing that probably people remember. All right. Not even the burrito. The burrito is kind of like in a little bit of a, I always call it the burrito essay because it's fun. Right. And it's like, oh, that's cool. She did, you know, you know, it's kind of humble. Like, you know, was making a burrito, solved that problem, helped some workers. But this is the thing that really mattered, right? In terms of the actual evaluation of the essay. And then finally, okay, she's talking about her future ambitions and how what she's done in the past is relating to her future goals, right? As a doctor. Um, and this is not what every student has to do. Like not all students have their goals and life planned out. And, you know, maybe what they're writing about doesn't even relate to their future goals. That's fine. But this really provides clarity to me because now I can start picturing this student uh, on campus, right? I can start picturing her as like an activity leader on campus. I can picture her in her future as a doctor. And it's like, oh, she seems really sharp. She knows this stuff, right? She's talking about using cardiogram and doctor cardiography, right? She's talking about needing to work together with patients, you know, kind of showing some contribution, teamwork, that sort of thing. Um, those are the things that really matter in this essay, right? You can start seeing all of the five different traits, like at different levels, right? You really see a lot of drive. You see the intellectual curiosity, the initiative, the contribution, especially the contribution, like wrapped up very nicely, you know, within this essay. And it's not the, yeah, there's some nice writing in here. There's some nice kind of vivid language or imagery. That's not the stuff that matters. Yeah, it's, it's nice. It's a little memorable. That, that's why we use this essay because it's kind of fun. Um, but you know, that's not the reason why she got in, right? It's just not, okay. It's, it's the content of the essay, uh, and the message and the traits that, that she's presenting within it. Okay, cool. Yeah. We'll take some other questions. Um, as I said, you can hang out on the prompt.com slash road to college, uh, website as, as well. Um, well, thanks Brett. That's a great example. It really, it really is. Because honestly, if I were to read the first version, I wouldn't think it's horrible. No, but, exactly. But it's, it's not. Right. But it's the not. second one really kind of like, you know, um, hits all like the important traits that you talked about. Yeah. And, and it's like, by the way, this is when admissions officers are always talking about how, as, you know, students read flat. Okay. So in other words, they're like, that's that 80% of students that they're like, okay, great. The student's probably similar to all the other students, right? How do I actually tell that they're different? How do I actually tell that they, you know, they really get set apart? And so many students really struggle to communicate who they are, right? And what makes them unusual, right? Uh, in, in, their, in their applications. You know, I, I, a student that I work with this past year, because I always work with a couple students every year, um, you know, he, he, um, he, he like got some award from, from Apple because uh, he, he like figured out some like iPhone exploit thing as part of their like, like hacking bounty program. And I was like, you know, you know, you should probably include that in your essays. And it's like, it was like nothing to him. He was like, oh yeah, you know, this is like usual for me. I was like, okay. Well, but like, so, this is like not usual for most students, okay? So to that point, and there was a question earlier, um, and there's two good questions here. One is like, how do you work with a student who doesn't know what they want to write about? Yeah, so that, it's a great question. And so one of the things that we always do that's, that's um, before we work with any student, okay? The first activity we have them do is what's called this application plan, all right? And so we talked about a lot of stuff tonight, like the goal of your application, right? To prove success in college and beyond and all of that. We're basically teaching that to your students, okay? Then we actually have them brainstorm different uh, ideas um, content basically related, uh, to that. Okay. So what ends up happening is they will come in and they will actually spend usually about an hour, hour and a half and write down a bunch of answers to these questions and related to the five traits. So these are thought starters. And then when we actually, they speak with their writing coach for the first time, the writing coach reviews all of this ahead of time and has some really tar good targeted questions for them. And what we do is uh, we sync all of this to this content plan here and we actually like live with the students start building out like all of their experiences. Okay. And what we find is, is that when you just ask a student, oh, what's the most compelling thing about you? Or like, what are you going to write about? They don't know. They can't really just think of it off the top of their head. But once they actually understand what their audience admissions officers actually care about, and then they're prompted with like very specific targeted questions about that they just like open up and we just see like students writing like sometimes like a thousand words <laughs> about different experiences and just like really rich content. And then we're able to like 
piece this out. And what's cool is, is then we end up with like four or five pieces of really awesome content that we then match to the different essays that they need to write. So we come in here and we're like, okay, great. So for Columbia, we have all these different essays that, that we need to write. We can actually assign content to this. So we can say, hey, this is actually the same as another essay, or we're going to start writing this from another essay, or we're going to start with new content. And I can actually just take this content that I've already written, and I just match it to that essay. And then I just click, okay, I'm going to start writing that essay. And your essay prompt and that piece of content is already there uh, for you to start writing with. Uh, so what this does is like this whole process is really about making sure that we first identify all of the most compelling things about the student and how we should work with them. And then we start thinking about, okay, which pieces of these content do we actually want to use for each of the different essays? Okay. And that's, that's kind of the magic uh, of, of, of how we work with students because it's really taking a holistic idea planning process rather than like, Hey, let's just write your common app essay. Oh, let's just do the, your next essay. No, we want to start with like, what's the strategy here? What's the plan? Okay. Uh, and what that also does is it enables us to start identifying things that the student can do over the summer and over the coming months that they can strengthen their application. Well, so, so that was another yeah. question. Like what so we type use that of, to figure that out? Yeah. What type, like, I mean, do you have any examples of like, what types of things might you find that some, a student can still do, you know, this coming June and July? Yeah. So the, the, the most common things I would say are, um, so number one is we find that a lot of students are super intellectually curious about certain topics. Okay. But they have spent relatively little time self-learning about those topics. Um, so in that case, we say, okay, why don't you go learn about that? Here's some ideas of how you can go about doing that. That could be like engaging with like online communities, like we had like Discord or Reddit or other things like that. Uh, we had a student last year that was like really into, uh, got really into like Wall Street bets, for example. Uh, and they were like on the forums there and like actually doing then some like, you know, trading, fake trading, it ended up being some really cool essay content, right? Um, but these are like just things you can prompt into the student is like, Hey, did you ever think of doing X? And it's like, well, I, I'm actually really interested in that anyways. I would normally just like to do that if I had the time. And now they get, we give them an excuse to do it because it will be really compelling for their essays. Uh, some students are really interested in more of research. And so they might actually attend, uh, get mentorship from, from a like professor or a PhD student kind of as they're working on kind of this intellectual curiosity project. And that can be really compelling. Um, you know, colleges that are highly selective will actually look at the research projects that students do even, uh, maybe as part of our portfolio. Um, it could be something that's even more artistic related. It could be, hey, I'm really interested in, uh, you know, writing my own music. It's like, well, then great, just go go do that, right? Because uh, then you can write about that experience or, oh, I was going to form a band and play shows. Like, Back in the day, like I had my own band in high school and we would actually play shows like around the city. I didn't even think of write about that on my application. Like we booked our own shows. We wrote our own music. Uh, you know, we, 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 you know, promoted them, like all of that, like didn't even write about it on my application. Had no clue that was interesting. Happened to come up with my interview, thankfully. Uh, and it was mentioned in my four to five sentences of notes that the admissions officers made on my, my application. Uh, so I got kind of lucky. But the key is, is like, there's all of these things that the students can go and do. Um, you know, it might even be athletic related. It's like, well, great. Like, why don't you really focus on improving the skill and then show in the fall, if it's a fall sport, for example, that you actually did improve, right? Maybe you became a starter. Maybe you became, you know, all whatever, you know, all district or whatever, all conference, right? These are all, or maybe, hey, I want to help other people, like other teammates actually get better, right? So we had some, have some students that actually go and like, you know, have workout buddies, right? And like, they all kind of work together to actually improve their skills, right? Um, we had somebody that was was really into rockets and them and their friends like created, built a rocket, right? These are all things that like could happen. But the key is, is like, you have to be able to say, hey, here's your interests or here's what you've done in the past. Um, you know, what are the things, like what are some of the things that you could think about going and doing? We provide little nudges and the students then just like, just kind of take off with it, right? Like, you don't, you don't really have to give them much 
sometimes much even additional support, right? Some, you know, we don't necessarily give that support. Other times they go seek that support, but it's, it's, it's oftentimes just giving them permission to go and do those things is really, really valuable. You know, some people are doing nonprofit stuff. Some people are doing community service stuff, but it's not just like, Hey, I'm going to attend some community service stuff. It's rather like, Hey, I'm going to actually show some leadership in the community or in my church or in, you know, like all sorts of different examples. Um, but the key is, is to really like start the planning process, figure out what is the most compelling experiences they have, and then give them some ideas of like, okay, here's how this one can be more compelling and have them kind of choose which ones to focus on. Uh, so so that Brad, was probably long, a long-winded answer, but like there's a lot to, yeah. to be done, right? And, and sometimes like, you know, this is not like you have to spend months on this or like hundreds of hours on this. It could be something that you've only done for like 20 hours, right? And, and still can read in a really compelling way. There was a question um, about, uh, and not all schools have this, but if a school has like a why that major, like why you're applying for a certain major and, or, and I, I guess it's really, um, if a student is undecided and a college is kind of, you know, asking that they declare a major, um, how do you, how do they deal with that type of a question when they really don't have, a, um, you know, a pressing desire for a particular major? Yeah, it's, you know, it's one of those things where, so like, if you don't know what major you're applying to, um, you know, sometimes you, you actually write that kind of why major, you can write it actually on being like undecided. Uh, so it, and like what your interests are. So we, we sometimes see that a lot of the why major essays are because you are applying to a specific major. Okay. Um, so in those cases, you actually do need to write it for that specific major because the essay may have appeared for that specific major. Uh, you know, in which case, usually you're writing about kind of some of your experiences related to that major. Why are you interested in it? Um, and, you know, why you're intellectually curious. Sometimes the, uh, it's like, why do you want to do this major at this school? So it's basically kind of a combination of tell me about why you want to do this major and like a YS essay of like, why this school? Um, so it really kind of depends, but it's, it's a little tricky and, you know, sometimes students are kind of like, here's what I'm interested in. Here's why I'm applying to this major, uh, because of what I'm interested in. And, you know, sometimes you just don't have to be like, uh, you know, you always want to be truthful, but you don't necessarily need to give away like every single one of your thoughts or, uh, concerns or, uh, <laughs> you know, whatnot in, in what you're writing. So there's another question. This is about like the topic to choose. So um, the person wrote, uh, a lot of teens I know are trauma dumping using topics like mental health, for example, um, and says by how well they overcome, they're, that they're writing about the trauma of that they came overcame mental health, like as their topic of an essay. And what do you think about that? Is that a little too tricky or dicey to write about? Yeah, so we've seen students do that very well and have success. Right, but there's like a couple of key storylines or through lines for that. One is like, it has to be some very clear and, and you know, understandable trauma in some way, right, number one. Number two is, is that it needs to be fairly clear from the writing that the student has gotten past it and as a result is like a significantly better person now, okay? Um, and, why that matters is, is when we go back and think about what do college care about, they care about students that are going to be successful at the college and after they graduate. And if they perceive you as potentially being a risk of not graduating, that's a negative. Okay. Um, and so writing about kind of more mental health oriented things can be very tricky in that regard, uh, because a lot of times it's really hard to kind of prove that, hey, I'm I've actually come out of this a much better person. Like, here's all the things that I've kind of done uh, as a result of this. So it's like what I call like an inciting incident. So like, hey, I had some mental health struggles and, you know, it caused X, Y, Z to happen. And that might be like the first, uh, you know, quarter of the essay might be about that. But, you know, I'm, you know, here's as a result of that, I realized X about myself. And then I took all of these actions based off of my realization. And now I'm this like different and changed person. And as you can see, like I'm this huge contributor within my school. I've done all these other things that maybe I wouldn't have done otherwise. 
Uh, I have really good work habits maybe as a result of this. Uh, you know, all of that sort of stuff that kind of proves that, hey, I'm going to be successful in college and beyond and, and even more so than other students because I've already been through some challenges, right? Uh, so, you know, a lot of times it's like you have to see like the very specific content and the way that it's been written about uh, to determine whether or not that is something that should be written about for that particular student. Um, there's a, another question, and this is Good to just clarify, and I didn't realize that people were confused about this, but I, but now I, I can understand why. Somebody's asking, what do you mean by uh, students having to, to complete two to three apps? Aren't they using the common app? Yeah, so each school has their own application, right? Within it's, the common it's, app. It's within the common application, yeah. but, yeah. Uh, and some schools are not on the common application. So it's a combination of those two, right? So... You know, mo it's not if you're writing a supplemental essay for one school that's on their application you're submitting, you're submitting it at that time. Like you can actually change the additional information section with each school you submit or even your common app essay with each school you submit um, because each of the applications like, yes, it's all within the common application, but each is an application to each school. Um, I know there was a question in here like, hey, can I start with. Uh, you know, the personal statement and one-on-one -on -one coaching and then upgrade later, you definitely can do that. Uh, a good number of families do that. Um, I will say is that the discounts that we have, right, the discount on like the all schools uh, is only eligible if you just start with that. We don't uh, have that, you know, later if you, if you upgrade uh, later. But we do have many families that are like, hey, I'm going to start with you know, just the, the personal statement essay and then continue on or three schools and then do all schools. Um, those are all things that, you know, that, that do happen uh, and happen pretty regularly. Um, the one thing I'll say is like, all of this is like guaranteed. Um, you know, we uh, stand by all, all of our work. And if, you know, you're not happy, basically, hey, you have a call and you get started with your, your writing coach and you're not having a great experience, you get a full refund, right? Uh, but that basically never happens. So I, uh, a few people asked and, um, that if they, should they be, are you starting with juniors? Like, you know, I mean, are you starting with students now or maybe in a few weeks? Uh, uh, I know it seems early, but yes. yeah. We're, we're, we're yeah. working with a lot of students right now. Um, now what I, what, I, what I always recommend doing is, is um, so if you're a junior now about to enter your senior year, you should just go ahead and sign on for this, okay? It is... It's like one thing you don't have to worry about, right? Which is making sure the applications are going to get done on time and get done really well. Okay. Uh, you don't have to worry about conflicts really with your students over, hey, you're, are you done with your essays yet or not? Right. Th those things are a lot less rare because we kind of take on <laughs> that conflict, uh, that, that conflict for you, right? And are texting your students and making sure they get done by different deadlines that they've agreed to and, and all of that sort of stuff kind of along the way. Um, but getting started, signing on now is really important. Then you can decide, hey, what date do you want to start? Um, and as I said, in particular, for your students, you want to start with the application plan as soon as you can, because we can then write the essay later. That's fine. But like, let's figure out all the content that you need to write about across your application such that if there are actions that the students can take, let's, let's you know, know that, right? Let's, let's make sure that you can also push your student to actually, or make sure that they have the time to go pursue some of those activities or pursue some of those interests. Because uh, then you'll also know that, hey, this is actually stuff that's going to be really important, right? Let's make sure that, that the, you know, our student has time to do that. Uh, there was also a question about, do you work with international students? Yes. Uh, we also work with, uh, I think last year we worked with almost a thousand international students. Um, so we do work with a lot of international students um, in, you know, pretty much all over the place. We do a lot in China, Southeast Asia, India, uh, Latin America, you name it basically. Um, and so we work with a lot of English learners as, as well, you know, kind of through that, through that process. And we train all of our coaches that work with those students on working with English learners um, as well. Okay, wow. So, um, uh, you know, if, if anybody's got more questions, 
throw them yeah, out you can, right you, now. There, there's a chat button like on the prompt.com slash road to college website. You can just chat us. That's one way to do it. You can actually email me at brad at prompt.com. Um, you can totally do that. Uh, I recommend if you want to do this, just do it tonight. You're going to feel good about it. Like it's, you know, if yeah, I was gonna say, you decide not to do it, we'll give you a refund, but like you're probably, I was going to say, we, we will have a few more sessions, you know, in the summer, but oh, yeah, it won't be, sure. but, it, but it won't be with the same, um, special pricing that's happening now. So, um, that, so that's, you know, just an encouragement. If you want to kind of get it off your plate now, that's helpful. Um, and I would encourage you if you sign up, I would start pretty soon, you know, just to, um, there's a lot of discussion in the chat, Brad, about, um, yeah, uh, about when people need to send in applications, um, you know, uh, and all I can say is the earlier, the better, you know, I mean, that's not to put pressure and you can't send, you know, if your student is applying to a rolling admission, obviously the earlier, the better. If your student is applying to any early, whether it's early decision or early action, you know, those are going to kind of come up fast. Um, some, some of them, October 15th, November 1st, November 15th, it all kind of comes up quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, better to get it done over the summer. Um, yeah, than... I, the, the couple of things I'll just, just highlight. One is, is that there are some institutions that are more rolling admissions or where they'll actually evaluate students' applications as they come in. University of Texas, for example, is one of those. So a lot of people try to get their applications done in like July for the University of Texas so they can submit it immediately. For example, uh, because the University of Texas will just run out of spots at some point, basically, uh, it's pretty common. Um, so, you know, most other schools, though, that have like, let's say, an October 15th or a November 1st early action or early decision deadline, um, they, uh, you know, are usually not looking at any of the applications prior to the actual deadlines. There are some situations that I've heard of that I just won't name the schools necessarily, but there are some that are out there that that you know will actually start reading the applications earlier um but that's not particularly common um i'll just mention uh especially because a lot of these admissions officers they're out recruiting students and making sure applications are coming in so they're really busy a lot of times before before the deadlines uh so just something something to consider um but i highly recommend always like if you can uh, apply it in your, if, if any of your schools have rolling admissions, just get it done. Uh, if any of your schools have early action, make sure you're applying early action. Early action is different than early decision because early action is non-binding. So you don't have to attend if you get in. You just find out you get in and you're like, great. Like, you know, in like December or January. Or whatever. And there was <laughs> actually a lot of discussion about um, scholarships because solid scholarships do have different deadlines than, yes. um, than the and, application. And it is sometimes not obvious. Right. Um, so... You know, uh, I think I forget which I think it might be USC and a bunch of other like kind of private schools in that kind of general category. Actually, a lot of times we'll have like a December 1st deadline that you want to apply to in order to get get that uh, get that done. Um, so, you know, a month in advance of maybe the regular decision uh, deadline. Uh, so just something to really consider, um, you know, uh, University of California system, I think, is November 30th every year deadline. But the key is just uh, you really want to get to the point where before the senior, you know, senior year starts, you feel really good about the position you're in from an application perspective, because once senior year starts, there's a lot of classes, there's a lot of activities, a lot of things to be doing. And this is like not what uh, you want to make sure that the students have kind of the mind, your students have the mind share to really be focused on this, because we see a lot of students get to the point where they're like, oh, you know, oh, great. We got like, you know, the top choice application or two done. And then they're scrambling for the last few. Uh, that's not what you want to have happen. And then they start feeling like, well, those schools, I'm not as interested in them. So I'm just going to put a little less effort into those. That's not where you want to be. Um, so, and we do a really good job of getting students done uh, early. Uh, so most of our students actually have their, uh, especially the ones that start now, nearly all of them have their top three choice schools done by the beginning of their senior year. So a few other good questions. One uh, person is asking, do you work with students that have learning disabilities like dyslexia? Yes. Um, so we work with a lot of students that have some form of learning disability and 
when you talk with your, your application guide, uh, you will want to discuss that with them so we can assign you with a coach that has a lot of experience with working with those students. Um, so when we when you kick off with us, you meet your application guide, you, you and your student, you learn kind of the whole process. We talk, learn about your goals and what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, and then we use that information to, you know, assign your writing coach, get you scheduled for your first session uh, and all of that. Uh, and then your application guide basically monitors your progress throughout the entire, uh, you know, application process. And if you have any questions, what's cool about this is you can just chat with us and your, your application advisor is there to answer questions. Your writing coach is needed uh, as well. Uh, and so that actually, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more because somebody asked something similar about um, how do your coaches work with um, students who might have busy schedules, you know, um, sports teams or where they're working, like how, how do you, how do you fit that in or. Yeah, I mean, basically what we do is like we set deadlines accordingly, right? It's not like we're, we're like, hey, once we start, we need to be done by X date, right? It's, it's a customized timeline. So when you talk to your uh, essay, you know, your, your application advisor, you're basically going to set up kind of a timeline for a plan for like, hey, here's when we want to do X, Y, and Z. Okay. And then we will track that and make sure that you are sticking to that. And if we have to modify it, we have to modify it. That's, that's totally fine. Right. But our, our goal is, is to make sure that you, you know, the student has signed on, your student has signed on uh, to be responsible for, for getting certain work done by certain timeframes. And, and we work with a lot of people, like a lot of very, very high performing students across whatever their endeavors are. So a lot of student athletes, a lot of, uh, you know, people that, you know, have extremely busy schedules for different activities, different interests. Um, you know, internships, uh, work, whatever it is, uh, it's very common. But we work with students across the spectrum as well, right? So, you know, it's not like every student, student that we work with is applying to a highly selected school or even a top 100, you know, ranked school, uh, even though I hate the school ranking system. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just kind of what, you know, we, we, we know. Uh, so we, we work with thousands of students, right? You know, on kind of all, in, you know, both ends of, of the spectrum. Okay, well, I think we covered a ton tonight. Yeah, hopefully we covered everything. Uh, as I said, if you want to reach out to me directly, uh, I'll be at brad at prompt.com. I'll respond today or tomorrow if I have to, if it's a long response, I might forward it to a team member of mine. Um, uh, but you can also chat live with us or you can go to the website, you can schedule a call with one of our, uh, our, our team members uh, to, to ask about anything, or you can just call us directly. I think we might even have some people available now. Uh, to take calls. Uh, but as I said, there's an extra $10 off tonight. Uh, it's on the prompt.com uh, slash road to, to college website. Uh, and we highly recommend taking advantage of that. That $10 is off, extra $10 off is good until at some point in the morning when our development team wakes up uh, and <laughs> if that change. So uh, that could be 6 a.m. Eastern, that could be 8 a.m. Sometimes it's 10 a.m. Eastern, you never know really in the grand scheme of things. Um, but uh, but that's when it's up until. All right, uh, so yeah, I highly well, recommend you taking advantage of that if you, if you can. Thanks, Brad. Thank you all for, especially the people who have who have kind of hung on um, and listened to all this extra information and just for showing up. Honestly, this is the end of April. This is probably the earliest we've started this, but we've learned in helping people that we kind of have to nudge you guys along to get started earlier. And so I'm really thrilled that so many of you showed up tonight to learn about the essays and hopefully you'll get started. It just honestly, it, you know, we, Brad and I know his team and we're available to kind of the very end to help people. It just becomes harder. Like when you get that phone call, you know, or that email, like a week before a deadline or even like, you know, it's just, it's just a lot yeah, it's more, more. It's more stressful for you all. Also right. prices are higher. <laughs> Right before deadlines, just FYI, uh, even higher than the list price that you see there. That's the highest list price. So, um, but you know, I, we're we're always there to help help out all the students. And you know, the way that we think about this is like, let's just you know, remove as much stress from the process, remove as much conflict between what you may have and your student may have, or even teachers or counselors, and, and have a trusted advisor to kind of guide you guide you along the way. All right. Very good. Well, thanks, Debbie. Okay. This is always this is always super fun. Always uh, to fun. Everybody for, for coming this evening. And uh, thanks. Thanks for everybody um, who had the video on. I'm waving to you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Have a good one, everybody. Bye. Okay.
Good night. Bye-bye.